Hi everyone and welcome on my presentation on risk management framework in renewable energy sector based on the example of company Energex. Now, during today's presentation, we are going to talk a lot about renewable energy in general, renewable energy markets, what kind of risks and some opportunities that can be found in this environment nowadays. And of course, we will propose a complete risk management framework for the company Energex. Now, before we start, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Artem Shevchuk. I am a Master of Applied Finance student at University of Wollongong in Dubai. And this presentation has been made for the subject FIN 959, um, aka Enterprise Risk Management. So without further ado, I would like to proceed further. But before that, just a quick thanks note, uh, which I would like to express to Dr. Florian Wessendorf, who is uh, a managing director of the Solar Middle East Conference that happened in Dubai in January. Uh, Dr. Florian was very kind in uh, replying my email and letting me to attend the conference while, while waiving my fees. So I was able to learn a lot about renewable energy market um, from very uh, recognized industry professionals. And some of this information I will be sharing with you today here as well. So our agenda for today is going to look as follows. I will start with a brief welcome note where I will sort of try to set up the mood for the conversation. Next, we are going to briefly discuss the details about the renewable energy market as such, as it is very important to understand the amounts of participants and complexities on this market in order to have uh, a complete risk uh, assessing understanding. Um, then we are going to quickly describe the company Energex, just uh, so we better understand what kind of risks they may face. We will then proceed to identifying specific risks while discuss, briefly discussing some examples of mitigation and some not traditional but interesting tools. And um, later on, we will do a re I will describe you a risk management framework which I propose for this business. We will discuss all the elements of it. I will explain what the risk management framework is, how it functions, what are the elements, and why it will benefit in our Um As one of the last points for today, I would like to introduce you one to a risk management dashboard Snowflake, which I have coded from scratch using RStudio and uh, Shiny dashboards. It's a tool which Energex can use to record, assess and monitor risks. And uh, we will reach to that part shortly. So as a welcome note for today, I would like us to start with, say, with a, a notion that Today's growth of renewable energy sector reveals an unprecedented opportunities for company like Energex. And in order to be able to grab those opportunities, we need to be equipped with a robust risk management framework because every opportunity has a risk on the other side of that coin. There is always a risk reward trade-off. And for us to be able to capture the momentum, we need to be ready in terms of risk mitigation. Um, a good news for you, board members, is that most of the risk management techniques which are available to today, they do not require a significant expenses or investments. It is all about the approach. It is all about the discipline. And this is what I will try to show and prove you during today's presentation. So I hope you are ready now to dive deeper into risk management for um, Energex and for renewable energy sector. And I would like us to start with introduction to the market itself. So we have a better idea on what we 
what risks we can expect as a company. Now, the key to understanding the risks that involved in operation of renewable energy company is through understanding the renewable energy market. It's a quite complex system which involves a lot of um, participants. It involves a lot of regulations and uh, different interesting features. So for all of us to be on the same page before proceeding to specific risks, we should have a very good understanding of what renewable energy market is. And this is what I'm going to briefly present you now. So we should start with uh, identifying the sources of renewable energy. I'm sure all of you know the basics of it, that renewable energy sources are solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and some more exotic sources of energy like tidal and biomass. Now, looking at this chart, which is the, char the breakdown of world electricity generation by source, we can see that the renewable energy clearly takes off in the recent years, especially offshore and onshore wind energy, and especially solar power. So uh, it seems like towards the end of uh, to towards the 2050, we are going to have approximately 80 to 85 percent of energy generated from renewable sources, which gives a lot of opportunities to company like us. Now, the renewable energy outlook in 2020 looks as follows. There was approximately $500 billion of investments in renewable energy in 2020 alone. The nowadays in UK, 56% of all energy investments are in renewable energy. So basically, most of the investments done in energy in general are now being generated in invest in um, in green power. Another interesting feature of uh, 2020 is increased investments in energy storage for photovoltaic for um, solar power generation. One biggest obstacle right now to to implement it on a larger scale in the world is the difficulties with storing the energy during the uh, off-peak hours and overnight. And uh, there are a lot of companies who work on resolving these issues and developing very advanced storage systems. And once that is done, the photovoltaic uh, solar power is expected to boost significantly. Now, 2020 has brought 52% of increase of investments into renewable energy in Europe and slightly slight decrease of less 12% in China. Surprisingly, COVID did not have a significant impact on renewable energy revenues, uh, despite of uh, reduced demand in the beginning of the pandemic. Towards the end, the situation drastically improved, uh, mainly due to uh, strengthening of political environment around uh, around the green energy and continuous support from the government. Now, it is being discussed between professionals that the solar power is up to take the lead and uh, the mainly the driver of the solar power taking the lead is the cost reduction of this energy source. To date, pho photovoltaics uh, demonstrated impressive 38% CAGR, CAGR, and um, it is expected that by 2050, by 2050, solar power will exceed 69% of the total energy consumption. Now, right now, as we speak, the solar power is the cheapest on earth unsubsidized solar unsubsidized energy generated from solar plants is right now cheaper than unsubsidized energy generated from coal 
gas or any other fossil fuel traditional fossil fuel source that we know and uh, current level of um, efficiency for the panels is on average 20 percent however by 2025 just within five years uh, market participants expect um, significant increase of uh, efficiency up to 26 to 29 percent with newest technological advancements there is a plenty of uh, interesting project types that have been recently developed uh, and introduced to to the market such as water harvesting stations and agrophotovoltics and as you can see on this graph the annual solar uh, photovoltaic installed capacity for the past 20 years is increasing dramatically especially in such regions as china um, asian pacific uh, europe basically everywhere and even middle east over here on the tip uh, starts taking off as well now those are just some pictures of interesting projects um, one is the water harvesting station and another is an interesting opportunity how to combine uh, farmlands and uh, solar generation of course all these opportunities despite how tempting they are and despite how um, encouraging it sounds for us as a company with existing assets with existing facilities it creates both opportunities and risks so keep in mind every opportunity in one instance could become a risk in another and we will come to this shortly now it i believe it's going to be helpful to discuss the renewable energy market structure as such for you to appreciate the amount of complexities involved so everything starts here with us with a developer who is building the power stations renewable power stations to harvest electricity from various sources to do that we involve the landowners the land own we, we usually don't own our own lands and uh, we rent it from other physical, uh, like just private persons or organizations on the basis of either rental or profit share. It really depends on how we negotiate. Then once we established good relationships with the landowner, the bank step in because we require financing. As you understand, um, building a power plant it's something that involves a lot of capital expenditures and companies like us we depend on external financing a lot next uh, element in this chain are the suppliers who supply the equipment once the power plant is in place once the project is in place the company us as a developer we are going to face a choice either we move towards with either we sell our electricity on the open market mainly through renewable energy certificates i will tell you a little bit later what that is or we sell it to utility companies through um, pre-agreed tariffs or purchase power agreements which um, and even here you can already see some opportunities at risks that arise from making either either choice say if we go for open market we drastically reduce our counterparty risk and we are able to gain the upsides of electricity prices in case of they go up on the other hand if we go with uh, contracts with utility our opportunities involve stable cash flows which is very important but in case if uh, the price will go up on the market we will not be really able to to take the benefits of it after this decision is made the electricity goes to end consumers who are either households or uh, industrial facilities now if you look at here there is a double-edged arrow from consumers to utility and you might be asking why that's because 
Nowadays, consumers are able to contribute to utility as well through the programs of net metering, which essentially is that households or industrial sites can install their own small photovoltaics power plants at their gardens or on their roofs. And the electricity, which is not going to be consumed by these households or industrial facilities, can be sold back to the utility. And at some point, we as a developer may end up competing with our end consumers, especially if it's, uh, if the amount of those consumers is growing. Now, in this around all this structure, there is a government. Government plays super important role in renew in the functioning of renewable energy market through providing oversight, subsidies, implementing green policies or renewable uh, renewable portfolio standards across uh, states or the entire countries. And we will come a little bit. We will definitely speak a bit more about the government because the relation, the, the way government approaches renewable energy nowadays, it possesses, it, it can create a lot of opportunities as well as a lot of risks. So some of the most interesting governmental, governmental policies that are in place in renewable energy markets right now are net metering, which as we discussed is just an opportunity for um, consumers to sell back to the utility to the grid the um, electricity which they generated and did not consume feed-in tariffs um, this is a policy which a sort of a government or enforcement which provides guaranteed above market price for producers like us uh, it is usually a prerogative of a federal government and currently such programs are active in ontario the, France and several states of United States and are essentially inactive in Chile. Now, you're probably wondering why I've selected these four countries. That's because Energex has direct operation activities and owns power plants in these four countries. So we will come to this a little bit later. Um, next, very, very important thing are renewable portfolio standards. This is basically a document which sets a minimum share of generation to come from renewables or from a specific renewable source currently renewable portfolio standards are active in nine out of ten provinces in canada more than half provinces of the united states and nationwide in chile so overall these programs create a very strong support and foundation for uh, our business operations to function properly. But of course, this will not last forever and it's subject of change. Now, since we now understand the renewable energy market better, it is time to look into the company Energex. We will review the most important areas of operation for our company just to wrap it around the whole picture of the market that we just discussed and after that we will proceed to identifying specific risks relevant for Energex. Let's proceed to discussing details about Energex. Energex is the company with the headquarters in Canada, in Montreal, and we are one of the largest Canadian renewable energy developers. So we have a very large history of being incorporated in 1994, and uh, our company went public a little bit uh, later, somewhere around the millennium. So at the moment, Energex operates in three segments, which are wind, solar, and hydro. Our regions of operation are Canada, US, France, and Chile. We have somewhat around 400 employers. Um, 
and currently we generate almost three and a half thousand megawatts of electricity from our renewable energy sites, which is comparable with one large nuclear power plant. Most of our sites have been acquired, but 25 of the renewable energy sites we actually developed ourselves from scratch. Our annual revenue in 2019 has amounted to 557 million of Canadian dollars, which is not really a lot at the moment, but we expect significant growth as we develop as a company. Now, here is a quick snapshot of uh, what we have in um, annual report. So basically, the net installed capacity by operating segments are being led by wind. So we really focus heavy on wind and a little bit on hydro. Solar energy, despite of its incredible opportunities that we have discussed just recently and recent developments, we are not yet there like a lot. So we, we really need to think about um, options of investing more into solar power right now. The breakdown by region looks as follows. More than half of our facilities are concentrated in Canada and 33 are in the US. France and Chile amount to a very small, um, a very small amount of power generation at the moment, which sort of brings us to a conclusion that our revenue sources are not as diversified as we would like them to be. And um, at some point, this may create risks for us. So this is basically the same information in a, in a tabular way. You may review it later if you would like to. And yeah, the, the, it was a quick introduction of uh, Energex as a company. And now it is time to look in the most interesting part of our today's presentation. We will identify specific risks that are relevant and I will show you some interesting examples of uh, mitigation and some interesting tools and approaches uh, how we can strengthen our position in risk management. Now, I think a good start of, uh, of this section would be through investigating what actual C-suite managers in renewable energy has to say about the risks that they, their companies face. So I came across the survey which has been done by The Economist in 2011. And the key idea of the survey was to understand what kind of risks are being rated by the um, actual renewable energy executives. So based on the survey, we can conclude, conclude that absolute amount of uh, in, of executives have has rated financial risk as quite high and uh, followed it by political, business strategic and operational risks. Now, after 10 years, the situation didn't change a lot. So I assure you that most of this topic are still relevant today and deserve a good amount of attention from our side. Um, I propose to continue this conversation by structuring all the risks that Interjax may face into six separate categories, such as operational, financial, strategic technology, electricity, and environmental risks. We are now going to go through each of these categories separately in order to have a better idea of uh, what is in it for us. So, we are going to start with operational risk, which has been further grouped by the Basel Committee into four subcategories, which is by source, people, process, information systems, and external events. Now, in general, operational risk is anything that may impact in a bad way, of course, the normal operations of the business. 
regardless of whether this occurred from the inside or from the outside of the organization. Um, there are a couple of life examples of operational risk actually happened and caused some damage for renewable energy developers, such as collapse of the equipment or even cyber attacks. Um, as a separate category of operational risk, I really, really want to highlight the political risk because this is something that impacts our industry a lot. And I think it's not a secret for everyone that renewable energy industry is being very dependent on political environment and political mood, especially nowadays. Uh, we are supported by various governments, proce government procedures and initiatives through renewable portfolio standards, net metering, tariffs, and lots of other good initiatives. But at the same time, by creating these opportunities for us, in case if we rely on them too much, and in case if those opportunities will suddenly go because of the political shift, it may have a very bad impact on our cash flows and on our income, basically. So um, over here on the right of the slide, you can see the diagram prepared by the energy uh, and the Department of Energy in the United States. Uh, those are the renewable portfolio standards implemented in every state of the of America and in in US as well as in Canada. Renewable portfolio standards. This is the prerogative of federal government rather than the cent central government. So for us, sometimes it's not even enough to have an idea about overall developments toward in in political environment. We really need to be very attentive to what is happening on the ground in every single state where we have existing operations or where we are planning to set up a new power plant. This is critically important. A lot, a lot of uh, reason, a lot of a huge chunk of political risk arises because of the competition of renewable energy with traditional fossil fuel giants and. Uh, it's not a secret that the fossil fuels such as coal or oil or gas, those companies, they have, they are very well established and they have huge political lobby. They have huge experience in um, pursuing politicians to, to their opinion. And at some point, this can cause a big damage for us. A um, couple of recent examples, I think. Uh, it's not a secret as well for uh, everyone that Trump administration really hated renewable energy and there was a lot of discussions from uh, the leader leader of the free world himself on how renewable energy is useless. That alone created a lot of tension on the markets uh, when it comes to share prices and in general. Now, some other countries where we have an operation like France, for example, right now they are in the process of revising the pre-agreed tariffs for earlier projects that they believe are getting an extensive profits right now. Um, and French government thinks that it's not really fair. But on the other side, renewable energy developers like us back then when they were planning and building financial models of these website of these um, power sites 10 or 15 years ago they have considered the tariffs to stay in place for a much longer time and you see a sudden shift in the mood of politician can can impact revenues and profits so there are a lot of ways of how we can mitigate operational risks based on those categories that we just discussed uh, there is no point to going through all of it. I will just highlight a couple of most uh, interesting things, in my opinion. So, since our company has an actual construction, since we are actually building things, um, we need to put a special atten attention on site safety rules and protocols, and we need to ensure that all our site supervisors who are responsible for the safety during construction are adequately trained 
there is plenty of organizations out there who provide affordable and world-class training for them so we need to be really careful here um, as much as possible we would like to use an insurance as an instrument to rather transfer risk than mitigate especially when it comes to health or equipment um, in terms of IT security and prevention of cyber attacks and uh, IT systems malfunctioning, I believe we should stick to ISO 27005, which has already very well described uh, frameworks and procedures for this particular category of risks. Um, and of course, it's very important for us to be on top of the game and monitor the political environment and ongoing regulation process in every single country where our operations are, along with the uh, regulation in states as much as possible. So now we are going to proceed with another category, which is financial risk. For us, uh, the most important aspect of financial risk would be the risk of financing, of either not getting the financing of, on time or getting too high cost of financing, which we just simply cannot afford. And um, I don't probably need to tell you, but delays in financing can lead to uh, severe consequences such as delays in new sites development or even a company bankruptcy which as happened to be the case with Sun Edison in 2015. So uh, there is a lot of ways how to mitigate the risk of financing. There is a lot of traditional ways how to do it uh, and we all know that for example maintaining healthy debt and equity ratio um, good relationships with financial institutions and uh, healthy credit ratings. We all know that. Now, there is an interesting tool which we could use as well in order to, to make our positions even more robust. Um, as an objective to keep the cost of capital low, we could probably target the reduction of cost of debt through a hybrid bond program. Now, what is a hybrid bond, you may ask me. A hybrid bond is a solution proposed by two gentlemen, two scientists, Mr. Lee and Mr. John, in 2015, um, in their paper, Financing and Risk Management of Renewable Energy Projects with a Hybrid Bond. So this is a proposal to create uh, something sim similar to mortgage-backed securities, but for renewable energy projects where many uh, independent renewable energy developers can participate and uh, originate financing for projects which are scattered around the globe. That way, one bond will combine different originators and different places for actual site execution. And by such a drastic diversification benefits that the end investor, the bond owners will, will, will receive. It might pretty much reduce the cost of debt for all the participants in this program. Now, this is not something that is readily available on the market yet. And um, we as a company, we can take an initiative and go out there to our competitors and propose them the joint issuance of hybrid bonds. Um, and I think all the industry participants will benefit from it so this uh, this could be this could be a good tool for us to look at the next uh, risk which we will discuss is the strategic risk and basically what it is it's a risk that affects or creates uh, or is created by an organization's business strategy and strategic objectives. So basically this is something that we would expect. The, the source of this risk would be the decisions of senior management. So some of the brief examples here are failure, failed M&As or 
agency problems if we are not able to select uh, reliable managers who who take care of our overseas operation. Um, reputational damage is uh, could be pretty much one of the reasons for strategic risk as well. Um, I would like to spend more time though on something that is called technology risk. So traditionally, what people think when they hear technology risk, it's being defined as the potential of, for any technology failure to disrupt a business. And you would be probably right now asking me, Artem, why are you bringing up technology risk here as a separate category if this is clearly something that is out there as a part of operational risk? And my answer to this would be is that I propose to look at technology risk from an alternative perspective. Um, remember how we discussed the increasing efficiency of solar uh, panels. So apparently it's not only solar power panels that become more efficient, it's in general, right? The wind turbine become more efficient. There are more and more advanced uh, ways of harvesting renewable power out there. And what it means for us that the older size that we have built and delivered 5, 10, 15 years ago, at some point they will become less effective and less competitive compared to the new entrants just because the technology is getting outdated so fast. Of course, it will significantly impact the value of the assets and it will reduce our revenue. So we might find ourselves at some point being outdated and it's a terrible risk for us actually like if you look at this graph for example this is um, a chart prepared by national national renewable energy laboratory in the united states and it describes the increase of solar power panels efficiency over the last uh, 45 years. So as you see, we have started over here from something like 4 to 8% efficiency, which was not even commercially viable back then. Nowadays, we are reaching an experimental efficiency of 48 and the regular commercial efficiency of around 24%. And it's growing even farther. And we expect a significant boom in technology uh, in, in the next decade. So Everything that Energex has built in terms of solar power harvesting 10 years ago, it will not be uh, commercially relevant very soon. And we need really to keep this in mind while uh, preparing financial models for our future projects and uh, trying to estimate the net present values of the cash flows that we will generate. Now, there are of course few ways how we can try to combat uh, this risk of becoming outdated and the first and the most obvious way, uh, most obvious thing I think to do is site planning and engineering. We need to make our sites easily adjustable to the new technology developments. For example, if there is a new highly efficient solar panel out there which is uh, which is commercially viable to replace our existing ones, then we should make sure that we have all those frames quite com uh, compatible, compatible and we need to make sure that the um, uh, that uh, industrial machinery can enter those sites and actually do the physical replacement. So this is something that needs to be taken care of by our senior engineers and architects. Um, and of course, we as a company, we need to stay on top of the game and track the technology developments as much as possible because uh, it's, it's cr crucial for our survival. So none of the new technologies developments in renewable energy should come for a, and caught us off guard. We should know about all these things. And for that, uh, our business development team should attend all the relevant uh, exhibitions and conferences as much as possible um, just 
to be aware of what actually happens in the industry and success through continuous education we need to invest in education of uh, our senior engineers just to make sure that everybody is aware about what about developments in the industry another important risk category for us to have a look at is the electricity price risk which basically originates from unfavorable change in electricity spot, spot prices green certificate certificates and lower than expected auctions now it is true that a lot of our um, sites operate based on purchase power agreements where we have a predefined tariff with the uh, utility grids for years ahead but some of our sites actually are selling electricity directly to the end customer based on so-called merchant model based on the spot prices of electricity and we mainly do it through green certificates which is nothing but the proof for the uh, end customer that he has purchased electricity from the renewable energy uh, developer like us and they, they need those certificates for to, to sort of put it on their annual reports and report that they are achieving the sustainable goals so anyway the fluctuation of green certificate prices it, it is similar to the spot prices as well those are very highly correlated things and uh, even right now there is a lot of uh, risks out there in the world happening around electricity prices uh, basically uh, over here you can see an article from india where renewable energy auction, renewable energy developers struggle from lower tariffs which they get through auctions through governmental auctions and of course of course with declining cost of electricity of renewable energy electricity the more efficient it becomes the less revenue we wind, wind and solar power is going to generate and uh, our marg margins eventually will become tighter and tighter especially with the growing competition in this market now another interesting category to look at is an environmental risk and uh, usually when environmental risk is discussed it's about how the company affects the environment but at this scenario actually we are the one who are suffering from environment more than it suffers from us i mean renewable energy does everything for the environment right we uh, our end goal is to make environment clean and safe but the environment doesn't help us on this way um, there is a lot of natural dis disasters and natural phenomena that can severely affect our electricity generation capacity uh, for example such as cloudy weather change of wind directions change of ocean uh, streams directions which impacts climate on a global scale rivers that are drying up and stuff like that increasing environmental risk leads to declining profits and reduced power output which in turn of course leads to the rising cost of insurance so uh, here are some examples of uh, how extreme weather conditions impact renewable energy and uh, there are ways of course how we can try to to mitigate environmental risk how we can treat it basically the first one is to try to avoid it through a very careful site planning and leveraging weather predicting algorithms and big data um, luckily with the farther industry develops the more of such tools become available even um, for for small companies we don't really need to develop it from scratch um, there are ways how to treat the risk uh, for example we can try the usage of weather derivatives for 
uh, especially for photovoltaic generations. Some companies, they do practice using those derivatives, but um, I must admit, it's a quite complex uh, thing to understand. And maybe for an organization like us, it's not something that we would go to go for as we, that we would use as a first tool then there is an option to transfer risk through the insurance and uh, luckily for us there is a lot of uh, offers from big insurance companies especially in europe and north america who are offering um, in, who are insuring the cash flows from the renewable energy projects um, and they uh, th that way we can transfer climate risk to them well this is it we are done with uh, our risk categories and now it's time to look at the risk management framework which i propose for energy energex to apply now i believe we should start this section with identifying first what a risk management framework is so a risk management framework is that structured process which is used to identify threats define the strategy of how are we going to treat those threats monitor and evaluate further to make sure that organization learns from uh, from the actions taken and that risk has been treated well and there are certain things that make risk management framework effective. It is being considered as an effective tool if, first, the risk is clearly defined, properly measured, mitigate, it, every risk category has its own mitigation strategy in place. The risk is therefore monitored and reported. And the risks are being treated through a company-wide government. So it's not really the risk mitigation. It's not only the job of one risk manager. It's the job of the entire company to, to take a responsibility and action for it. Um, there are a few key elements of the risk management framework as such as Basically, risk management framework will be will be will consist of uh, a set of documents and principles such as risk culture, risk management policy, which is a separate document, identified risk appetite 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 and tolerance, operational model on how to the organi organization is going to uh, treat the risk, and well-defined and explained risk management process. Now, we will go through each of these subcategories to have a little bit better idea of what's in it. So our risk culture, the Energex risk culture, um, in general, this is the way our employees identify, understand, discuss, and act on the risks confronted or taken. And uh, here are the couple of the rules that I propose to be in place. First of all, the executive key team and the board of directors have a key role in promoting risk management culture and allocation of resources. Without your support, guys, without the support of the senior management and the board of directors who is here to oversee the executive team, my hands will be tight. I really need you on board in order to make this framework operational. Now, it's not only about the seniors, of course. Uh, every employee, contractors, volunteers, and whoever is involved in the functioning of our organization has to be involved and has a part to play. And acting on risk management framework it's not optional. It's something that is an obligation of, uh, of everyone who is involved in this process. Uh, of course, good risk management practices shall be encouraged and rewarded, and bad, re bad risk management 
practices should be taken as an example to the organization and heavily penalized to make sure that it will never be repeated again. The next uh, part of risk management framework is our risk management policy. And the risk management policy states the outcome-based objectives and commitments to managing risks and contains the following components. Um, it contains, first of all, rationality to managing risks, linkage between the energex objectives and other related policies, accountabilities and responsibilities, and this is very critical and important because without making specific people at specific roles accountable for their areas, we will not be able to, to control this process well. Um, the conflicts of interest, of course, should be reported and treated accordingly. Commitment of, to resourcing the risk management functions, it's an important, important point. Um, performance measures should be in place, of course, uh, because if there is no way to measure the performance, then there is no way to say whether their performance was good or bad. And we need to accept that our risk management policy should continuously be revived reviewed and evolved based on current uh, market and organizational challenges. Next uh, part of the risk management framework would be to identify and specify risk appetite, appetite, tolerance and risk capacity that our organization is willing to take. So basically, this pyramid clearly illustrates um, all those key elements. So the risk appetite is the amount of risk that we are willing to assume. Risk tolerance is the amount of risk which is at acceptable level. And the risk capacity is the maximum amount of risk that, are, that we are willing to uh, assume as organization in each and every category. So obviously, we, oh, we, over here we are going from top to bottom. We need we need to aim for the lowest and hope for the best, sort of. Of course, leaving some buffer at risk capacity to, to, to make sure that we withstand some outlier events. Um, operational model of Energex, I believe it should look as follows. We should have three lines of defense. And the first line of defense will consist of operational areas or basically those departments that do operational work on a day-to-day -day basis. The second line of defense is going to be me, the head of risk. And uh, the third line should be the internal and external audit plus the risk management committee. So this is the a quick diagram of how I propose to to organize our lines of defense. Over here at the mod at the bottom, you will see the first line, who is basically done of country managers, senior architects, engineers, and site managers. At the second line of defense, there is me, there is risk management com com committee, and executive management team which is then being reinforced by the third line of defense that consists of internal and external audits. Then all of this reports to the chief executive and third line of defense will report, will um, coordinate with both chief executive and the board. So um, next is the risk management process and um, for the risk management process I just propose us to to really accept the ISO 31300 uh, which is which describes the principles and guidelines of risk management and we will follow this process in uh, our risk management as well 
All right. So we are done now with lots of very important points. We are done with reviewing the risks in general and we have reviewed my proposals for specific uh, risk framework for Energex. There is only one point left. I believe that it is very important not just to talk about the risk, but also have some interesting and uh, specifically designed tools, especially tools that would record every risk accident be able and, be, and help us to sort of have a bigger picture of what's happening in our organization. And that's why I propose you to have a quick look on the risk management dashboard Snowflake, which I have designed for Interjex. Um, the dashboard can be accessed through this link. It's available online and you can all just type it in your browser and uh, play with it a little bit, but please just don't crush it because it's a little bit sensitive. Um, the purpose of this tool is to measure, record, monitor and analyze a one stop solution for everybody who is involved in the risk management process to to have a comfortable bird's eye view on what's happening here and well basically this is how the uh, the dashboard looks like um, it contains the data table of all the risks that have been recorded in our organization in the past it contains the live risk matrix based on the likelihood and consequences um, it contains the chart of actual yearly losses uh, painted according to the risk category. And over here we have all those, so all those six categories which we have discussed previously, they're all here. And uh, so you can play with it by, a separate, by filtering the data set based on uh, risk categories or selected geography and all of it will be updated here accordingly live now just don't bother about this video here uh, i will upload the video with my presentation uh, here as well once i'm done the recording so this is it thank you very much for your attention and for your time i hope it wasn't boring i hope you've been able to learn something new from this presentation and um, I'm sure both of us, us and the board, uh, we are meant to make the Interjex a safer place to work and uh, reduce the risk for our shareholders through very fruitful cooperation in the future. Thank you very much. And now I'm open for your questions, if any. Thank you.